Ivan Lendl is one of the most famous tennis players of all time. He fought his way into 19 Grand Slam singles finals and won eight of them. In 2001, he was inducted to the International Tennis Hall of Fame. He currently coaches Andy Murray, who won the London Summer Olympics in 2012, his premier Grand Slam title at the U.S. Open, and this year's Wimbledon under his guidance. Yvonne owns the world's most complete collection of original posters by the Art Nouveau painter Alphonse Mucha. And after ending his tennis career, he took to golf, earning a handicap of zero. You've been judged and labeled by the media people over years, and you've got many definitions of who is Ivan Lendl. It started with Ivan Hrozny, the Ivan who is always in control, you know, the sophisticated face that never smiles. If you would have to define yourself as an identity, who would you be? I don't know, a, a guy who likes to have fun. Who likes to have fun? Why is fun so important in your life? Because I like to have fun, I like to smile or laugh, and uh, when you laugh you don't have to smile necessarily, but uh, I like to play practical jokes on people and uh, I enjoy funny movies and so on. And was it always like that? Always. Always like that, always. since you were a small boy? Yes. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> where is the seed of this humor inside you? I don't know, I don't know where it came from. Um, I don't know that I could really, even if I thought about it, uh, if I could pinpoint it. Is there a lot of humor and fun in playing tennis? You can have fun playing tennis. Yeah? Uh, yeah. So how do you do that so you have it? Well, it, it depends what happens there. You hit a crazy shot, lucky shot, uh, you enjoy it, you laugh and have fun with it. Because it looks like a strong game, you know, like a serious one, full of concentration, discipline, you know. Even sometimes they're swearing, you know, brain-breaking stuff. You can swear and have fun at the same time. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. So what was your attitude while you were playing actively? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed training very much. Uh, I enjoyed uh, competing as well. People most of the time complain about training. How do you say, I enjoyed it? It's like hours and hours, I guess thousands of hours of training. Yeah. I did what I like to do, I enjoyed doing it, uh, so it was fun. Is playing tennis or was playing tennis for you uh, a kind of uh, act of joy? Is the playing the joyful stuff in it or winning? Uh, both. Both, obviously, when you win, you enjoy it even more. But uh, I enjoyed practice sessions. I, I did enjoy even more than playing matches, actually. I, I did have uh, most fun on my home court uh, behind the house uh, practicing with, with uh, other players who were friends and uh, having a good time. Yeah. How did tennis change you as a personality? You started out very early, so I think it would be silly to ask you who would you be if tennis would not encounter your life? Yeah. Because it's hard to imagine who would you Obviously, be. Obviously, I don't know what I would be. Yeah. Uh, the regime was different, so the opportunities were not there. And, uh, and uh, same thing, I can't tell if it changed me or how it changed me. Since we know, and thanks God, it did enter your life, how much did it form you, change you as you grew? I think sports do form you. They teach you hard work, they teach you success, they teach you failure, how to deal with it. And, uh, and uh, some sports, as we were talking earlier, like golf, teach you honesty and uh, other good values. Sometimes you are getting lessons from life that are repeating themselves because somehow you don't learn from what is happening to you. In sports, did you have these kind of challenges where you said, oh, here we go again, it's coming back. I didn't pass, you know, this landmark. It seems to me so difficult. Did you have these break even points where you well, had to challenge yourself? Th there is never the same situation over and over. There are similar situations, but hopefully you have learned from the one previously and you handle it better. It does not mean that you you're going to win or succeed immediately next time, but uh, hopefully you have uh, another opportunity until you learn. When is the starting point for you in an athlete's mind to get ready for a match? The night before. What happens then? Oh, you, have to, uh, you have to prepare for the match. You have to know your strategy. 
you have uh, you have already done your training, so I don't even start with that. That uh, if you play Australian Open at the end of January, you already train in November for it. But but uh, for the very match, you start preparing mentally the night before. You focus. You make sure that uh, you don't watch some silly, depressing movie. So so you're positive, and uh, you have to eat properly. You have to get enough rest. You have to have enough uh, fluids in you and eat proper food and so on. At the era of tennis where you played. Um, I'm not a professional, I don't understand sports, but I do understand that the game itself changed from that time a lot. Uh, what do you think? Was it easier at that time or is the task heavier today? Uh, it's more difficult today, not only in tennis but in all the sports. Why? Well, the training is better, the athletes are bigger, they're stronger, they're faster, they have better training, they have better nutrition, they have better coaching, and all of that together just makes them better. Uh, they, there is more depth, especially in men's tennis, than, uh, than there was uh, 30 years ago or 25 years ago, and uh, it's more difficult to be consistent. And you have the joy of exploring potential, because at that time about the nutrition, who talked and taught nutrition. And I, I read some very, very old newspaper articles calling you silly, like what is this guy doing? He's getting, you know, the special preparation, he's controlling his food, he's even doing jazz ballet or something, something like that, silly stuff. So people were picking on you like, what the hell is he doing? You know that saying, the one who laughs last, laughs the best? And this is what happened. Yes. <laughs> How did you feel at that time when you were doing it? What made you believe that it's worth the effort? Well, I, I was trying to get better and uh, whatever it took I would do and uh, you just have to try to pick what you think will help you the most because you can't do everything yeah. and whatever you decide you stick with it and hopefully you chose the right things. Did you have the right people to help you to analyze what situation at stage you are in and what is the potential that you have within you? Well, I had, uh, I had a team around me, starting with a coach and nutritionist and uh, physio and so on. And, and we always discuss things. And, uh, and, uh, but you, in, the, in the end, you are the one who makes the decision and who has to live with it. But you get all the input you can, you can get and uh, make the best decision you can. does not mean you will be right all the time, but you make the best decision you can. Whose advice you took always? Nobody's. Nobody's? Nobody's. Somebody... Uh, e even the smartest people are not right all the time and uh, and you know even my coach at times I didn't think it was 100% right or it didn't feel 100% right or I couldn't do it properly so I didn't go with it I just went with something I was more comfortable with and uh, so you you take from the people you have around you hopefully you have the right people so you have the most most time you take their advice, but there are times where you just say, wait a second, it just does not make sense to me, I can't do this. You discuss it sometimes, and sometimes you have to make a decision on your own, and uh, sometimes you just don't follow it. Today you're coaching yourself, and I was uh, reading some of the articles with Murray telling me, or telling the audience, that basically they had picked you because they can rely on you that you always tell the truth. I try, I try. And it's surprising that it's so special. Well, I tell you why it's special as a coach. Because coaches make good living, they make a lot of money. And if the coach gets fired, he doesn't get the money anymore. As in my situation, I don't need the money. I do it because I want to do it. And if I tell Andy the truth and uh, he doesn't like it and he tells me, hey, we're done, I say, okay, I go back home and uh, spend more time with the family and with mm. the dogs and play more golf, which is fine with me as well. So I'm in a very good situation because of that, that I'm not afraid to get fired. So you personally have a kind of freedom? Yes. Around and you. I think it serves Andy very well as well, because I can tell him the truth and don't have to be afraid. I understand he has a certain goal, but I would like to know what is your goal by coaching him? <laughs> My goal? I, I don't really know what his goal is. I know he achieved one of them, and hopefully it's not the ultimate that he has more goals at Wimbledon this year. But uh, my goal is to let him or give him a chance to win as many majors as possible. Do you believe that there is a certain limit where an athlete or a sportsman can say, thank you, I had enough? Everybody is different. Somebody is never happy, somebody is happy at some level, and, and uh, everybody is different.
It depends on what? It depends on the person. On the personality and himself person. and person. person. Yeah. How did you manage? Did you have a time when you said, oh, I think I had enough? No, my body said I had enough. Oh, but so it's your body that my was body, telling you... Yes, no more. <laughs> no, no. No more, yeah, it's too hard for me. But uh, I, I did have goals and I always reset my goals or they were not the goals where I could not play after I reached it. There was still more for me. Mm -hmm. As some players said, I, I have achieved this and I never had any motivation anymore. It happens. That's why I said it depends on the person. Do you know that... Without this kind of, you know, sign you got from your body, <laughs> from your physics, uh, without it, do you think that you would be able to manage and you s to say just, okay, I'm done, the work is finished? I don't know, never thought about it. It was not, I was, I still wanted to play a little bit and my body said I had enough, I can't do this anymore, so I didn't have to think about that. Because it's like a kind of calling of gladiator, you know? You build your muscles, you yeah. build, you know, the capacity, the intellect, and you work on it very, very hard. And you need to be in the arena to show and to prove that it was worth it. I don't know that I would look, look at it that way. No? But uh, you, you just do what you love doing. I felt very fortunate that I was able to to do what I love doing and get paid for it and very well at the same time. Yeah. Some people believe that actually you win the game in your head. It's a big part of it. How big? I don't know. You could, somebody says 20%, somebody says 80%, but it's a very important part. So what is this insider game in your brain, in your beliefs, in your thoughts, in your heart that needs to go on so you really get prepared? Well, you have to have confidence. Self-confidence. Yeah, which comes from training and also from success, from yeah. winning matches. You get confident that you can do it again and again. And you, when you're young, you beat somebody who is on the tour. Then you say, okay, if I can beat him, maybe I can be there too. Then you beat somebody who is in top 100. Okay, same thought. Maybe I can be in top 100 or it's not going to be as hard as I thought. Or, and then you beat somebody from top 10 and you get closer to top 10 and you play good even matches with top players and say, wait a second, I'm pretty close. If I improve this yeah. and improve that, maybe I can get there and keep trying. So that, that's your mind which does that. Was it difficult for you that you could not share your thoughts? Maybe, you know, when you get the preparation, when you travel for matches, you see, you know, your... I don't like to call it enemies because I don't believe that you had seen, you know, other players as enemies, yeah, but, but competition. And you cannot share what's going on inside you. you didn't why have a would problem you want to share that? it with your competition? You share it with your coach. You spend a lot of time with them, don't you? You do, of course you do, but uh, you, you wouldn't share that because that's, uh, that's something which they could use against you. You share it with your coach, you discuss things like that with your coach if you feel there is a need to discuss it. And there has to be absolute trust present, so of the course. relationship works? I always call it the patient-doctor privilege, that you don't discuss it with anyone, either oh. between the two. For example, when I started working with Andy, the media, British media was asking me what we're going to work on, and I said, look, it's like a doctor and a patient. You're never going to hear it from me. And they stopped asking. <laughs> they understood, they got the yeah. message. When you go to matches today, compare the time when you really competed yourself, right. what kind of uh, environment do you see? What is the quality of relationships in the business, in the tennis world? It changed. Uh, the players have bigger teams around them. And it's more professional. That's why they got better, as I was saying earlier. Uh, they, they have better nutrition, they have better training, they have better coaching and there are teams and uh, they have better, they have physios as when we traveled, we traveled either with one coach or by some players traveled by themselves. You very rarely see a player by themselves now. Yeah. When you had made the decision to become a coach of Andy, what did you discuss with your family? What were the questions rising before you said finally, yes, I take it? Well, obviously the kids were very important. Uh, but four of the kids were already in college and one was just about to leave home. So, so um, that made it easier. I, I always said if Andy came to me two years earlier, I would have said no without thinking. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what was more important two years earlier? Well, kids were at home. They were still in high school and at home and I needed to be more home more. I couldn't go for 25 weeks away. Yeah. And uh, 
And then, of course, I had to discuss with my wife the amount of travel and uh, whether she would go on the road as well or, mm -hmm. or how it would work and, uh, see if it, and we decided to see if it works. So at this moment, I see you as a father as well and as a husband as well. And there were not so many occasions you talked about your team back home, your own family. So how big role did they play in your success? Well, uh, we didn't have kids when At I was still time. playing, so, so that, that's not in the equation. And it's very important, especially you need to be happy in your personal life as well. As, uh, as in, your pro to be, in order to be successful in your professional life. And, uh, and it's very important that uh, your wife does help you instead yeah. of uh, putting more demands on your time during the events and so on. I think Gary Player talks about that quite a bit. Uh, he has talked about that recently. Did you require a special interest in tennis or later on in golf uh, from your beloved ones? Well, I, I required from the kids that they're interested in sports, yeah. that, uh, that they do pick up a sport and uh, they play tennis when they were younger and then they switch to golf, three of them and two of them into horse riding. Mm -hmm. Because I believe, as I was saying, that sports lead and teach kids good things. Yeah. You didn't mind when your wife could not understand, you know, the, the rules of the game like in golf or, you know, whether you come home, you know, with a trophy or not. You didn't care? No, no, no? I, I play golf for myself. I don't play for, <laughs> for anyone else. Purely for your I, enjoyment. I just enjoy it, yeah. For purely for So what do you see in the future for yourself? Uh, can you even imagine yourself without not being actively sporting, doing the routine? I, I don't see myself sitting at home and not, uh, not being outside. This picture doesn't work? Uh, not for me. It may happen, but it won't be voluntary. What would you miss? I, I just love being outside. Be active? Yes. Because what does it give to you? What kind of feeling? I like feeling? to move around. I don't, I don't like sitting in one place, especially indoors. Whether it's me playing golf, following the kids yeah. playing golf, go to a hockey game, uh, go rollerblading, play some tennis, be out with Andy for his practice or his match. Yeah. I just like being out. I don't like being inside. Yeah. It's worse for me if we're sitting somewhere and it's raining and we're sitting in the locker room all day. <laughs> I'm miserable. I hate it. <laughs> Do you have any habits that bring you really like big enjoyment? Uh, things you, you started to do or places maybe you started to visit? Anything special, unusual? I like that to gives visit you pure uh, enjoyment. It's not unusual. I like to visit good golf courses. <laughs> That's why the trip in Australia, I always love it, because in Melbourne there are some world-class golf courses, and uh, fortunately I get to play them, and I love it. Yeah. You invest a lot of energy, a lot of time to work with young people and children. So if you give them advices, what kind of advices they get from you? And I do mean advices like how they should be prepared mentally to enjoy. You, you don't go that far with kids. So what, what, I, I what just do tell them, talk? hey, do a sport which you have fun doing. If you don't have fun, don't play. If you don't have fun playing tennis and you prefer to play soccer, go and play soccer. Because if, you, if you're doing something you don't like doing, you will stop eventually anyhow and you will be miserable. Just have fun and enjoy yourself and then work hard. I don't like to push things on kids. When they're ready, they can ask. And uh, many times they do. Mm -hmm. I would like to get back to your life. Uh, we were trying to draw a line of yeah, your that life. Was interesting. Yeah, how does it look like? And it's, it's interesting that it was quite regular, <laughs> you know, the line that you that yeah. you draw. It had its ups and its downs. At the points, at the point of down, what did you learn about yourself? Well, I had to retire from tennis because of a back injury. That that was my down. That was. Uh, I would have liked to retire on my own terms, but that's part of life and, uh, and uh, nothing I could do about it. Did you have to fight with yourself? Well, you do something for so long and all of a sudden you can't do it. It's a small misery that you're pushing in and you're trying and... Yeah, it, it happens. I mean, I happen. still consider myself fortunate that uh, my injuries came uh, at the end of my career, towards the end. People don't play past 34. Mm -hmm. I was 34 when that happened, but people don't usually play past that. Anyway, uh, that something like that didn't happen when I was 25. Look at Andy right now. He had back surgery. He's 26 years old. Yeah. Well, I was fortunate that I didn't have that. Yes, did I have some injuries? Of course. Did I have some surgeries? Of course. But nothing that serious. And, uh, and so 
once you put it in perspective and you find other things to do and uh, kids get older and uh, you can start teaching them some stuff, uh, mm -hmm. th then it goes, that line goes back up pretty quickly. Was it easy for you to go back and to play exhibition matches? No, that was difficult because I had to learn how to play again. Okay. I haven't played in 14 years. As and you, you forget wouldn't how to use play. your legs for walking, yeah? Well, I, use, I did, did work out, did a lot of biking and stuff like that, but uh, uh, you don't hit tennis balls, it goes away pretty quick. And uh, it took me probably about a year, year and a half before I hit the ball the way I would like to. What made you to come back? My back has gotten better. Do you still play tennis? I do play. I'm going to play next week a little bit. Uh, probably, I, I like to play between 40 and 50 minutes, maybe four times a week. So I, I believe golf is helping you a lot with these kind of injuries, walking a lot and being outside. Well, stand, no. Standing around doesn't help me much, no. but uh, golf has helped me in many other ways because I was trained to compete all my life and all of a sudden I couldn't compete. And, uh, and my wife said to me, oh, now, now you're just playing golf. I said, yes, you know how miserable I would be at home, <laughs> how bad it would be for you if I can't compete. <laughs> and she just started laughing. What do you think what the, the people who saw you as a small boy competing in Czech Republic, people who might not be alive today, who watched you, your career, would tell about you? Who did Ivan Lendl become as a person? I, I don't know. I think there were a lot of people who, has, who have helped me. Uh, I was talking today about my first coach and uh, he passed quite early so he didn't even see me get uh, to the Tour and World stage and uh, I would think he would be extremely proud. I, j I can only guess, of course, but uh, just like I'm proud of Andy when he wins Wimbledon, I'm sure he would have been proud maybe even more so of me doing what I did. I would like to think that. Are your parents alive? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What do they see? I don't what know. Kind of we never man? talk about that. No. No. Uh, I, d I don't like talking about tennis, uh, whether it's with them or uh, with anyone else. I don't like talking t about tennis. The only two guys I talk to tennis about right now is uh, Andy and Danny, his, uh, his uh, hitting partner and coach as well. Your mom, your dad were actively playing. Yes. I've read stories that they really took you as a small boy, as a baby, yeah. on the court while yeah. they were practicing and yeah. playing. So tennis was a huge part yeah. of your life. Yeah. It still is. And you try to avoid conversations about yeah. that. Yeah, uh, 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 it's, it's like talking, for doctor talking about surgery at home all the time. I do it as my profession. And when I get away from it, I want to get away from it. And I don't want to bring my work home. Did you dream with tennis? Sometimes. Yeah? Sometimes. Not anymore. I Not dream anymore. golf now. You dream golf yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> what are the challenges in golf for you right now? <sighs> Too many. I need to get better. Let's make a short list. <laughs> short list. Uh, probably more time for, yeah. for it to practice more and uh, get my short game better. How many hours a day you practice physically? Uh, in the gym? Mm -hmm. uh, probably two. I, uh, Daily. I like to go to the gym in the morning, go, do a light workout, do some stretching, then I go and play golf. At those moments when everybody would, you know, wait for the moment like, I won and this is my time, now I should enjoy it and celebrate. What did you do in those moments as a champion, as one on the top? Well, the many times you're so tired, you don't have energy to celebrate. There's just no space. There, there yeah. is, uh, you have to do, obviously, your media and so on yeah. and so on. And by the time you get home, like last year, Andy won the US Open. And by the time he got to the restaurant where everybody was already waiting for him, was three hours later when he did the media and uh, all the pictures and so on and so on. And I wasn't there. I was tired. I went home. And uh, he, he said by the time he got there, everybody had already so many drinks in them, he couldn't catch up. So yeah. he didn't drink. So how did you manage? How did you do it? What was the sp sweet pie, you know, the nice point in your career with sports? Well, how well, did you reward yourself? You like remember I said the kids start playing, start doing sports yeah. for their parents and then they start playing for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's how you do it. That's, that's what the reward is. You satisfy yourself. How did you reward yourself? Because you oh, are I, famous for being very, very tough on yourself. I'm, Discipline, I'm already stoic. I'm already rewarded by having success because that's what satisfies me. So people see what you're able to do? No, no. I, I did what I said to do. 
So you, you like delivered, you walk your word. Yeah, I, I, I achieved what I wanted to achieve mm -hmm. and that's satisfying to me. And whether it's winning US Open in tennis or winning club championship in golf, it is very satisfying. You, you reached your goal, now it's time to set another goal. Which is easy for you, by the way? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you're coming up with new challenges and very, goals very, very quickly? Very easily. It keeps you in flow. Do you believe that golf and tennis are fair? No sports are fair. None? None. You know why? You never, very rarely, do you get what you put into it. Many, most of the times you get much less than what you put into it. But it's worth trying. What kind of life would you like to have? Peaceful one. A peaceful one. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy, uh, as much as I enjoy being outside and, and uh, first of all, I don't see myself not being a sportsman. I can't see that. As long as my body allows me, I will always be active doing something, whether it will be rollerblading or playing golf or hitting a few tennis balls here and there and so on. I will always be active. But uh, I think what people don't understand that I can be at Wimbledon with 18,000 or 16,000 people screaming and be satisfied with that. I'm equally satisfied being at home when even if my wife is away somewhere with the kids or so, and spend the time, spend the day with my dogs and speaking only to them all day and not seeing another person, that's fine with me as well. I'm, I'm okay with that. So this stillness, the quiet peace. Oh, I love, I love quietness. I hate cities. Silencio. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like, uh, I like being in uh, nature, uh, where we have our summer home in Connecticut. It's, uh, it's in the country. And uh, I could go biking for two hours and maybe see three cars when I go on the side mm -hmm. roads, which is great. And uh, I, I love walking with the dogs outside and going for, for uh, rollerblade, rollerblading and just enjoying my own thoughts. So we should leave all the viewers with this thought. I wish you on this journey a lot of moments of stillness, a peaceful moment. And I wish you physical strength because I know you desire it and you love it when you have it. Yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, th thank you for the wishes. And uh, with the physical strength, I think I have to achieve it by trying and going for it, not just waiting for it to happen. I just please have a happy life. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Thank, thank you, you for an interview. Thank you.